Roger, great question. Roger says, and I had a couple of discussions with this actually, might review this too. This was a coaching session I had with Lisa today, who recently just purchased the blueprint this week after watching a couple of the videos uh, from last week's discussion on the married put positions. And Roger says, what, if any, are the downsides to using inverse ETFs for setting up a married put position? None, <laughs> in, in fact as long as you believe the market, Roger, is still bearish, okay? And that those positions would be moving up in price. Now, I'm gonna log on to my radioactive trading account. Let's navigate quickly over to radioactive trading. And for Blueprint owners, there is this webinar here. Uh, this, these are members only webinars, further information and discussion on the married put concepts, income methods, and much more as you can see. But there's a full video here on playing the bear side of the market. And what we talk about in this case is ways we might adjust an existing married put if we feel the market is turning bearish. I had a gentleman, uh, another coaching session today with a gentleman who sold his shares of stock um, in a married put position because he was concerned about the inflation numbers, but also his stock was declining before this came out. So he sold the stock, took a small loss on the stock, but left the put open. And he's looking for a buyback price on the stock at a low range. That's one of the ways we could consider managing an existing married put. But in this discussion, Kurt talks about just buying the put maybe on a stock and setting the money aside. And I go through the discussion of buying married puts on inverse ETFs for bearish markets. What is some of the risks involved? In normal market conditions, the common discussion, Roger, of using a married put structure on a regular ETF is that in normal market conditions, regular ETFs, SPY, QQQ, IWM, have lower volatility. I said normal markets now, not current. <laughs> have lower volatility so you don't get to see large movements or larger movements, maybe two, three, four percent per month that you'd see on more volatile stocks. You see maybe one, one and a half percent per month movement. What does it mean? It means that takes longer to get to your position. It takes longer to see the goals you want. And it also is a little bit more difficult to get the income you want on something with a lower volatility. Do inverse ETFs have a lower volatility? Well, there's a trade-off. Inverse ETF SH. Oh, let's just use the married put search by symbol. What am I doing? Let's just go to SH. And standard married put. I could use November. We're just going to use January Roger to keep it simple. And let's go to more results. In general, I'm going to look to be one or two strikes in the money. It's at 16.09 in that case. And yeah, this, this is an outlier due to some wide bid ask spread, I'm guessing, but the 19 should have a lower risk than the 18 but that's okay. The 17 itself is fine, even with a 5.5% risk. Applied volatility is 0.2787, and the volatility of SH itself, its movement, I'm sorry, I want to go to stock research. 20-day volatility is at 0.27. It's about the same, okay? So yeah, I don't know if I would go with the 18 strike at 4.5% risk. That is attractive. It's 11% in the money, but why not go with the 17? It's only 5.5% risk for 224 days. Now we talk about what do I expect when I open a married put position, Roger? When I first open a married put position is because I believe, I feel that the stock has the potential to move up maybe three to 6% in the next 20 to 40 days, meaning the market itself would be declining three to 6% as well. But with SH, what are we, we're talking about a very low price security. Okay, so a th let's just take the five. So we're talking about, you know, an 80 cent movement here, roughly. So if the stock goes up to 16, let's call it 1690. 1695, might even call it 17, but let's just call it 1690, Roger. We hit calculate. Yeah, we're gonna see some movement on the positions, but the pricing model here is expecting only a small return of about four or five cents, and it's because it's such a lower priced position. That's a 5% move. That means SPY would have to drop another 5% 
in the next 20 to 40 days. Highly possible with things that we've been seeing. Roger, don't get me wrong. If you get lucky, you get a 10% decrease. Where are we going to be at? We're going to be at 1770, 1770, 1775, right? So a roughly 10% decrease, we're looking at a 50 cent profit on the position with the expected decay of that 17 strike. Now it's out of the money. You could roll it up and do that as well. Where I'm going with this is that although it's pricier, I think you might see better movement on an inverse ETF in this case, because I've tried SH before and I found that it moves more slowly. The generating income against it percentage-wise is correct, but we're looking at very small amounts. I'm curious if the double is not a better approach. SDS, the ultra short S&P 500 at 48.18. Um, January, same expiration. The stock's at 48. Uh, probably going with the 55. It's more expensive and putting more money in, of course. But I think we might see more monetary movement in this case because it's a double. Oh, it's 9.4%. Yeah, that's, that's the advantage of the single inverse ETF, Roger, versus the ultra is I'm going deeper in the money, essentially, and I'm doubling the risk. Pretty close to it. But you see more movements with these, and it's easier to generate income. So again, we take you know, that 5% movement in the first 20 to 30 days or so. Oh, I didn't adjust it for 20 to 30 days on SH. I'm going to go have to back and do that. I am really sorry, folks. It was looking at the halfway point out into October. That's not what we wanted to see, was it? So $2.5 movement. So let's call it 51 close to it. So if this goes up to $51, Let's do a fair comparison this time. First 30 days or so, July 11th, yeah, 83 there. So we, we see some increase, of course, in the stock countered by the decrease in the put. We have a much higher implied volatility, so they're going to swing. I'm sorry, Roger. Let's go back to SH and do that analysis correctly <laughs> in those scenarios. All right, so we are January, and I said the 17 is a 5% risk. There we go. Oh, 5.1% at midpoint. Okay. And so once again, oh, sorry, folks, with the 80 cent movement, we were calling it, let's just call it... Uh, yeah, just close to 17 there. Let's put it uh, 1695. I think we did, right? 80 cent movement, 5%, but let's do it for one month, folks. Not for halfway point. And yeah, see, you're still seeing a little bit more decay here on the movement, not getting as much as you want. You get a 10% movement, which would push us about 1780. Let's do 10% in a month and a half, okay? Uh, profit of 8150 again, but that profit of 8150 against an investment of 1791, you're looking about a four and a half, five percent return. It's what we expect, right? 50, realizing maybe 50, 55 percent of the gain in the underlying stock price. All that being said, one thing to consider here again, I, I just wanted to illustrate the prices of some of these because the SH is SH, the uh, pro share short SP 500 is really low price. Yes, you counter that by proper position sizing as discussed in the blueprint to make the risk one to two percent of your total portfolio. So you might be doing 500, 600, 800 shares of this as opposed to 200 or 300 of SDS, which took the higher risk going even deeper in the money. But, um, oh, I'm sorry, where I was going here is let's just go back to big charts for SH, relatively the opposite of the first chart we looked at previously. Uh, we're going year to date now since January. One thing I've also found tough normally, <laughs> Roger, excuse me, with the inverse ETFs is that they were usually quite quick. Just as you've heard us maybe talk before, about how um, those strangles that I had mentioned or buying puts or buying calls on the VIX, once the movement happens, you got to make sure you're adjusting. So I did a married put on SH, if I did, excuse me, Roger, if I did a married put on SH at the beginning of the year, let's say I was out to December or to January, 
I want to make sure I'm doing the income methods here because right at this point, after I probably saw maybe an unrealized four, four and a half percent gain, maybe a little bit less, but three or four percent gain on my position, maybe up to five percent gain on the married put, a week and a half later, it's only a, probably a profit of one, 1 1.2. And then here, it's probably only a profit of 0.3 or 0.4. Now I'm back up to probably a profit of three or 4%, 5% on the married put position. Actually, likely it's probably a little bit more, it's closer to 8%. And then right back down here, we're probably only at 2%. So just like a regular married put, it's important. This was that extended run, of course, from April to May. You would have seen high returns on these positions if this roller coaster continues, Roger, as we mentioned at the beginning of the discussion, we looked at the year to date so far. But then right here, you've given up probably a third to a half of the return here. I mean, you've got a lot of opportunity to do income methods in these markets. And now this movement back up, again, we got to be cautious. Wait a little bit next week. Why do I say that? Was today an overreaction? I don't think it was an overreaction. I personally, a uh, family of four, two, two young girls, you know, uh, one just is wrapping up second grade and the other starting kindergarten next year. They're not teenagers yet, but they eat a lot. I'm definitely noticing inflation. Of course, it's summertime now too. So, you know, we're taking them to swim. We're going to be driving them to swim lessons. They're going to be taking a vacation to see their, uh, Diana's, uh, my wife's parents, excuse me. And then we're going on a different vacation together. Well, we're going to be paying a lot of gas and there's a lot of food. There's a lot of things to purchase for all that travel. I'm definitely feeling it. I'm going to be feeling the inflation. I know all of you are as well. But again, changes the budgets, but was this an overreaction to that? Are we going to start coming back down on Monday or Tuesday? We're going to see. But yes, Roger, I agree with you. And in my statement at the beginning of the presentation, I said that I expect more roller coasters and continued volatility as we approach the halfway point. The next half of the year, I expect the same unless something drastic changes. Inflation is not drastically changing in our favor. We saw that. Supply chain issues are not necessarily changing in our favor. I saw an article, someone said that, you know, due to all the retail companies saying that they have increased inventory uh, because they ordered too much and not planning on ordering anymore. Those of you that track the shipping stocks, that's why the shipping stocks got buried earlier this week because the dry bulk index that's on the London exchange dropped 20% because Companies are saying they don't need to order anymore because they have too high of inventory. So the, what do they call it? The spot price of traveling dry bulk goods and shipping declined 20%, I think it was. Zim got destroyed, Eagle shipping, Diana shipping, things of that nature. Again, where I'm going with that is that without some change in one of those three things, something changes for the best, hopefully, in Ukraine. Supply chain issues start to clear up now that China's opening back up again and other things, but the bulk index shipping says that's not likely to happen. And we're seeing lumber fall quickly because the housing builds aren't, is in demand anymore. And of course, inflation in all of this. Until any of those factors ease, I expect the roller coaster. And honestly, that was my discussion in that free webinar, well, not free webinar, but in that webinar for blueprint owners about how we play this in the bear side of the market. My preferred approach for doing it is trading married puts on the inverse ETFs. And there's a lot of opportunities here. And I've done this twice. I've done SH once, maybe back in 2012. I can't remember. I'll look that up for you. And I did the uh, inverse Qs, the standard, not the double. Those weren't the kind of movements we're seeing in this market. They were down, but it was very gradual, Roger. And it was frustrating to me because I thought I picked the right stock and it was moving in the direction I wanted. And I saw a return in the first 20 to 30 days. But if I didn't do an income method when I did, 20 to 30 days, I think it was 40 days later, I was right back to break even where I had started. Okay. Just like trying to play the VIX you know, using the VIX as a hedge, when you see that first move, you've got to make sure that you manage it right away, sell half or do something along those lines. Because normally what we see is the bearish markets, the bearish moves are usually slower and not as defined. You know, the big jump today, are we going to continue up? It looks good. Maybe if it settles a little bit, might be a good buy point because we're expecting roller coaster, Roger. 
to answer your question directly, what are the downsides to using the inverse ETFs? The standard ones I feel tend to move more slowly. You're seeing price movements, but they're also lower prices. So SPY drops 5%, you see a 5% on your underlying, but you're talking about 80 cents here on SH. It's, it's a smaller movement. You're getting the percent she wants, but it's a smaller monetary movement because it's a lower priced security. That's And also income is sometimes lower. Let's take a look at income. Did this here. That's good. 17 strike. Um, yeah, I'll go 35 days out. One over 50. Premium's 20 cents. That's good, right? It's about a 1.7, 1.8% yield, but it's for 35 days. It's not really high. But then the 18, the higher strike's only at 15. Would I sell the 17 call right away if I open this married put on SH? Maybe, maybe not. It lowers the risk from that 5.1 down to 3.9. But remember, we bought this because we're expecting more turbulent markets. I probably don't want to have a capped upside and two ways to lose when I first open the position. I'd likely wait for it to move above 17 then see if I can get this sign of premium or a little bit higher for the 18 strike or 18 and a half as it starts to move in my direction and maybe manage that put as well. But Roger, as I mentioned, that Blueprint Owners Only webinar, playing the bear side of the market, that is my suggestion, is looking at the inverse or maybe 2x inverse ETFs for bearish markets as a married put play. I, had, I know I mentioned it in a webinar and I wanted to do it and I didn't. Um, I can't remember when it was. I think it was, it wasn't January. Yo, it was leading into April. That's right. Mid-April to going into May, I think there was a webinar where I mentioned that I'm considering another married put on SH or the inverse, and I didn't do it. And I'm kind of regretting it a little bit, of course, but I still have time to get into it. And I'm, depending on what Monday or Tuesday happens, Roger, I, yeah, you've, you sort of convinced me, so I appreciate it. I'm going to look to potentially open a married put in the Fusion portfolio um, on SH or maybe SDS or maybe TQQQ next week if I still see continued downtrends. But yes, it's going to be far out in time because the markets, the bulls are going to try to push back on this. We know that. You know this. Remember, this is not SPY. This is the inverse of SPY is what we're looking at here. So this jump up, yeah, inflation, it's going to be hurting and it's not the numbers that people wanted to see. But hey, the market's going to want to push back up eventually. That's why I'm saying, was this an overreaction? Are buyers going to start coming back in on Monday or Tuesday after they have time to digest it and get things over the weekend? Are we going to start to see this settle back down to these prices? And if so, you know, this is still probably a good target range for a long-term married put in a roller coaster type market, which again, I mentioned that I'm still expecting. Don't know if I'm going to be right. You know, I, I, I can't, I'm not saying that I'm not making a projection. I'm just expecting more volatility with everything that's going on. And that additional discussion we had in the beginning for uh, taking a relax, taking a breather, Roger, uh, and seeing, you know, what issues are currently out there for us. Okay. So it's a great idea. It's my preferred way to trade the married put structure with protection in a bearish market. And the downside is just the standard ones, as I mentioned, sometimes slower moving and because they're lower price. You're seeing the percentage gains that you want, but you look at your portfolio and say, oh, well, I'm up, SH is up two and a half, three percent. My married put position is up one and a half to two percent. It's doing exactly what I want. You only did a couple hundred shares and you look at the numbers and you realize, oh, that's only um, 38 to 40 cents. Okay, well, <laughs> you know, it is what it is because it's a lower price. And that's one of the frustrating things I've always had with the lower priced uh, married puts themselves. But that's what I had to start out with when I first uh, was connected with Kurt. I just took about uh, 2,800 or so uh, for my portfolio to start trading a couple lower price married puts, Office Max, which was, I believe, at 10 or $11, Domino's Pizza at 13. I just shake my head when I say that one. I just, I had a great married put. Success on that in 2008, 2009 was Domino's Pizza was at 13. It's one of those ones you say, why didn't, when I took the profit, why didn't I just hold 20 or 50 shares as it went up to $300 and $400 uh, in 2020 and so forth? So always a little bit of regret you have. And it's hard to, as you, you, all, you all know it, as you trade longer and longer, you look back 
a customer will call up and say, Hey, what do you think about McDonald's? I said, Oh, McDonald's is a good quality stack. You know, it's usually around 80 to $90. And yeah, I'm talking about someone who last looked at McDonald's price seven years ago. <laughs> I had no idea it was up as high as it was because I haven't looked at it recently in my screens. But yes, the great benefit of it. Oh, and, and a comment comes in. It says, well, if you're contemplating a roller coaster and sort of bearish, why did you even open the married put on Starbucks? And it's because it matched my criteria. It came up in my search results. This is not the portfolio I want. My apologies there. So I don't mind having two married puts open. Oh, there I am. Sorry, folks. Which are bullish trades. AIG, again, as I showed you, could be closed for loss even, I'm sorry, closed for a small gain of 0.3%. Let's call it break even, okay? And the stock's down 13.8% from where I purchased it. Starbucks is down 4% from where I got in, but it was all due to today's action, all right? This was open on Tuesday. And yeah, the stock did exactly what I wanted for the first, let's just go one month, shall we? There we go. And so on the seventh here, you know, the stock did exactly what I want, peaked just above 80. My cost basis was 78.86. I'm sorry. So it's not a big move, but I just have the 80 put. And so there are, I should have sold an 82. I was scared to because I was still bullish on the position, but I was going to sell an 85 call, knock the risk down by about a quarter to a third. It was, it was more about a quarter. And I didn't, but I still see the trend that I want in this position. And today I knew I was taking the chance. I was okay taking the chance with the inflation numbers coming out with this position open because why? Because the risk is completely controlled. The maximum risk is only 6%. I'm sorry, 7%, 7.5%. And that max risk only occurs if I hold the position all the way to December expiration, November expiration, excuse me, make no adjustments on the trade. Otherwise, because I'm retaining most of the time value I paid into this position that was only $1.20 or so in the money, so $664 maximum risk in this case, it's still holding that. And of course, the increase in implied volatility helped the position today as well. Yes, if I hold it all the way to halfway point, but even if this stock continues to fall, let's say it goes down to $73 in another 10 days or so, yeah, about half of the loss that I expected but that's okay. I'm okay with that because it's still controlled. It's only a 3% loss. And of course, following the rules in the blueprint, I can always adjust this, get a lower cost basis and a lower break even as I'm expecting a rebound at some point. My trading against myself, if I open a married put now on SH, not necessarily because I'm bullish on these positions. I've navigated this one to a very low risk position that can be closed for a profit. This one I just opened did what I wanted to first, but then the surprise or potentially an overreaction today based on the inflation numbers. We'll see more on that if we hear from the Fed next week, if they're deciding that, yeah, we think we are going to the 0.75 rate hike, that's going to cause some issues. So again, I'm leaning towards Roger that it's okay to have a position that has a controlled risk, one that has a very, very low risk due to the income methods discussed in the blueprint, and one that's actually increasing in the bearish market while these two low risk positions are only seeing a loss again of small numbers and i'm seeing a gain of two three or four percent on sh while these are losing i think that's okay because i'm not saying i'm totally bullish on the market i'm not saying i'm totally bearish on the market just like those long strangles i mentioned i'm attempting to play both sides in the portfolio because the goal is to make money and come out ahead minimize these volatile market swings with the proper protection in place of the married put structure as discussed in the blueprint with the ability still to do income methods.